Hello everyone, this is Joel Aliyev. Uh, this is going to be my first tutorial for CGTootsPlus.com. Uh, it's going to be focusing around a project that I worked on a couple years ago uh, with a studio in Vancouver, Prime Focus. Uh, it's based on the movie Tron Legacy. I was a CG supervisor slash kind of layout CG generalist for a number of months on that project and this first tutorial that I'm going to do is going to kind of focus on um, some of the workflow R&D tricks that I worked on while working on that film. Uh, hopefully it'll be something that you guys can carry over into your own day-to-day -day workflow. Uh, since this is my first tutorial, I'll give you a little history and kind of breakdown of uh, where I come from and what I do. I am a CG generalist slash effects artist based in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know where that is. It's on the east coast of Canada. Um, it, it's the sister city, I guess, across the bridge from Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is the capital of Nova Scotia. Um, I've been here for well, basically most of my life, but I set up shop uh, my own little studio that my buddy John Mitchell, who now works as an effects artist out at uh, Scanline in Vancouver, Back in 2006, we started our own little company called um, Delicate Machines, and we kind of focused on a lot of, you know, pretty much everything. Um, our main interest was feature films and high-end commercials, music videos, stuff like that. And before we had started in 2006, I had three or four years experience working on various films, so films like Hellboy. Day After Tomorrow, uh, Sky Captain, Sin City, things like that. So I kind of leveraged that experience and knowledge that I had, brought it back here, and we start, opened our own studio in 2006, like I said. And you know, since then, we've worked on lots of cool projects. Did some work on Narnia uh, down in Guatemala, of all places. Worked as a sequence supervisor there for a bunch of shots using 3D Max and various particle tools. Did some work for MTV, uh, worked with Madonna on a couple of projects, which was pretty cool. Did some token beer commercials. Then we kind of decided to you know, step out of our safe zone here, our little, uh, our little box, and you know, decided to do a bit of traveling as a team. Uh, we relocated to Winnipeg, worked uh, with Frantic Films on Dragon Ball, then again on Wolverine. And then we my buddy John moved out to Vancouver, and I went out there for a couple months, worked on New Moon, he worked on Avatar, did some work with uh, Maynard James Keenan of uh, the band Tool, huge Tool fan, did some work uh, with him on his uh, website, or winery, sorry, uh, or website for his winery, Caduceus. Then did some work on Tron, um, what else, Transformers, TV series, commercial work, did some work with Kanye West, that kind of thing. So this kind of gives you an idea of uh, what I do, you know, kind of where my interests lie. Uh, that being said, um, one of the big projects I got to work on back in 2010 was Tron Legacy. I mentioned previously that I worked with Prime Focus in Vancouver, relocated there for, I believe it was six, seven months, did some work as a CG supervisor there, kind of oversaw layout and R&D on a bunch of effects, worked on shading, lighting, building assets for various uh, shots that we had in our sequence, and then came back mid-summer and kind of worked out of my home studio here for a couple of months just helping out with R&D, uh, general pipeline issues, developing effects and whatnot. So one of the things that I wanted to focus on today is um, there was this big sequence, uh, the Solar Sailor sequence in uh, Tron Legacy. If you haven't seen it, you should check it out. It's a pretty cool movie. Uh, lots of great effects, and the art direction in the movie was just amazing. You know, it was an amazing project to work on. It was some, you know, sci-fi movies are generally pretty cool, but the director Joseph uh, Kosinski on this, you know, who directed this film, just had a, an amazing vision. And the city is incredible. The amount of detail and yeah, it's just phenomenal. But anyway. Uh, what I wanted to focus on was uh, there's this video that I I published on my um, my personal Vimeo account oh God, about a year ago, and it was a couple of shots 
and this is one shot specifically, it's a shot of the solar sail kind of flying over. And it's this part of the sequence in the movie where we kind of, we're leaving the city and we're going into this ca canyon. Actually, I'll bring up uh, the Vimeo here. Or, uh, sorry, here we go. I'll maximize this. So we have this sequence with the solar sail. We have our hero characters up here that are you know, discussing life and philosophy and whatnot. And as the solar sailor whips around, the camera kind of reveals this canyon that they're going towards, which is eventually going to take them down and they're going to meet their uh, the enemy of the film or the uh, their arch enemy clue. Now while working on this project, there was a very defined look and kind of direction that um, production wanted to go in. They wanted something that was they wanted something digital in nature, but also something that, you know, the regular viewer would kind of interpret as a canyon or, you know, some sort of cliff wall that this thing was flying through. So the biggest issue was, you know, coming up with a, a tool set or a methodology, I guess, of creating assets that were flexible, almost uh, procedural in nature, that would allow artists and people to you know, people who were working on the film to create looks and styles that were easily changeable. Um, you know, you don't want to spend a lot of time modeling an asset and then have the director say, you know, no, that's not what we want, that's not what we're looking for, we'll go back and change it and then have to go back to the drawing board and, you know, spend another week or two kind of developing a look. So the idea was to create something procedural. Uh, let me ex exit out of this here something procedural that would allow us to um, you know, make changes on a daily basis basically, you know, come up with multiple iterations of, of uh, shots and models that the director could look at. So this is kind of the, the approach I took and I posted this video, like I said, a year ago and I had a bunch of people actually write me, explain, you know, kind of asking how do you do it, you know, what tool are you using, what not, so I published this and it's a basic particle system, actually. Um, it leverages box three in PFLOW. And it's a simple system that allows you to, you know, customize the look, the scale of these, you know, various blocks and bricks and whatnot that you're seeing here. So you can kind of see that I'm uh, dragging spinners and changing stuff. So that aside, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into Max here. Okay, so here we are. We're inside 3ds Max. Uh, I'm currently using version 2013. Uh, the only plugin that I'm really using, or that I used in this scene when I initially created it back in version 2010, was Box 3, of, uh, or for Preflow. So if you're using, you know, 2010 up to 2013, you're going to need a license. I do believe if you're on version 2014, um, Box 2 and 3, I think, is part of the default install now. I don't think you need a specific you know, secondary license to run that. But like I said, if you are on 2013 or under, you're going to need uh, a license in order to get into the nuts and bolts, I guess, of uh, the flow. So what we're looking at here is a meshed out version of the particles that I created. Um, all I did is I created the basic PFLOW systems and then kind of took those particles, baked them out into a mesh. So now I actually have um, geo here that I can select and move around as opposed to having to select and move a particle system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up, uh, actually here I'm going to put outliner over here, I'll use outliner. If you don't use it, you should, it's pretty cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide this stuff. Uh, I'll hide the left side too. Bring up my particle view window here. Oh, and I'll turn on particles. Uh, actually, they're hidden right now. All right, so here we go. So what we have is, I'm just going to minimize that there so we can kind of see what's going on. So these are particles uh, before they're meshed out. And what I've done is created a, I created three flows essentially. So uh, I have one for our main rock system, which are the bigger rocks. Then we have a detail, which is kind of secondary. And then we have a smaller, 
version uh, for smaller detail. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll just color these a little different here so you can kind of see exactly what uh, each system is kind of responsible for. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to minimize this here so we can kind of see what's going on. So we have three si three separate particle systems and the idea was to create a um, procedural system that would allow us to create and kind of sculpt and mold this canyon I guess but give us the ability to go in and change things very rapidly you know working on a movie production you have a lot of feedback coming in constantly so you want to be able to create an asset or a tool that allows you to go in and kind of address those comments as quickly as possible so that's kind of why I came up with this method of uh, creating this canyon wall and the way it works it's a very simple system um, well, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn off these two secondary particle systems here so we can just kind of focus on one and gain some uh, viewport real estate here. The way it works is we're using box 3, we're using a data operator. I'll just open this here so you can kind of see, see it. It may look complicated, um, there's a lot of nodes in here, but it's really not that complicated. Uh, essentially what I'm doing is I'm birthing particles onto a plane and that plane has a texture on it and then essentially I'm telling through this data operator where particles are placed on the black part of the gradient be small and where they're on the white part of the gradient you know kind of grow and be bigger scale up so the way it works is I have these things called birthers uh, I'll hide them here I'm just going to turn off these particles here so you can kind of see what's going on. So what, what I did is I just created three planes. I'm just going to change the color of this one here so you can kind of see what's going on. So really simple, like uh, nothing complicated. We have three planes, so we have one for our large, or our first system, our second system, and our third system. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn two of those off so you can kind of understand better what's going on. So all I did is I created a plane it's a simple plane here. Uh, let me select here. You know, with a few segments, um, really long, very minimal width. And then what I did is I threw a noise on it. And what that allows me to do is kind of scale and move the noise. And I'll show you in a second how that comes into play. And then what I did is I threw a material on here. So you can see at the very beginning of the plane here we have a black. And then it kind of fades into a nice white gray here as we go to the back of the plane. So the way the system works is it, it's a standard flow. So I just create a standard flow. I'm birthing um, a bunch of particles here at the very beginning. And it's a very quick system too. So for example, right now we have 500. If I change it, you can see that it's very quick to update. And as we populate more and more particles, they're just randomly being birthed on this plane. So I'll go back to value 500 for that. Then I, instead of the default uh, position icon, I just swap that out with a position object. And for the object or emitter object, I just went and selected the, uh, the larger birther plane here. And it's going across the surface. I have a speed set to zero. I could probably take speed out of there actually. It's not really going to affect anything because it's of a value of zero. Rotation, I didn't want any rotation, but I wanted to throw some in there just in case we had to go back and kind of alter it a bit. Um, I can rotate them down if need be. Um, you know, ro rotate them on the Z axis. And then the shape instance, this is kind of where, where the cool stuff happens. So, uh, base rocks, where do I go? Here we go. So these are the base rocks that I use to instance as my particle, or used as my particle instances. And all they are, they're simple. I'm just going to hide our PFLOW window here. If I zoom in here, turn on our wire, edge wireframes. So these are groups. So I have a group for the details, which were the really small rocks that we saw here earlier. A group for the base rocks. And then a group of, I believe these are just being used as general, as the uh, the big rocks. And what I did is, uh, let me open a group here. So it's really, really simple setup. 
if I turn off the modifiers here so you can see as I turn that off the particles update as well. So I just took a box, um, converted it to an edit poly, so if I wanted to go back I could have complete control over that. If I wanted to add more faces and get more detail I could do that. Then I s did another edit poly here which selects all those faces essentially then threw a UVW map on it and then I threw a skew so that's kind of giving us our you know, our lean to the rocks that we see here. Then close that as a group, we'll bring up uh, particle view or six again. So I brought in that group as um, our shape instance and then just chose group member. So that's essentially going to search through this group and ch choose each one of those boxes as a separate instance. If I didn't do that, what would happen is pflow would treat the whole group as one object and therefore you're getting, for every particle you're getting all these boxes. But if you choose group members here, then it's going to look inside that group, read each individual object as its own particle and then transfer that over here. So that's how we get the shape. Now the, trick, the tricky part I mentioned is the, uh, the data flow. And while it does look complicated, it's not that complicated at all, really. Um, let me minimize this window here a bit. Shrink this down here so we can kind of get a little more real estate here. So if you look here in the particle view window, when I have that node selected, um, we have our edit data flow, which brings up this window, exposed parameters and whatnot. So what I did is I went in and exposed these parameters. So I'm just going to hide this window again so we can kind of see what's going on here. Um, I have a min scale, a max scale, a max size variance, and a min size variance. And what this does is allows me to uh, control the scale. And essentially what it's doing is it's taking um, that gradient that's on this birth object here into account. So I have my min scale which is taking everything kind of on the dark side of the spectrum and scaling it up or down. Go back to 95 for that. And then I have my max scale which is doing the exact opposite. So that's taking everything on the lighter side of the spectrum and kind of scaling it up and down with a, a certain amount of fall off. And then what I also did is I gave us a little bit of uh, variation here to play with just to kind of break it up, break up the uniformity a little bit. And then, of course, we have our object to get colors from, which is our birth object. So when I go back into the data flow, essentially what's happening is I have a, we're bringing in that piece of geometry, which is kind of exposed right here, right here. And then it's taking the points on the surface, reading the color of those points, and then essentially calculating an average between you know, light and dark. And the way I set it up is uh, we're going to have a max value and then a min value. And then we can kind of play in between those two values to create, you know, our biggest rocks and our smallest rocks based off that, uh, the birth. And then we have a min size here, which you, I've exposed right here. And then I have a variation too. So if I change this variation right here, you can see that change reflected down here. It was 3.0, or 3.0, now it's 12.5, which is exactly the same as it is here. And then we have, so those min and max values are essentially being fed into this, which gives us our scaling of the rocks based on the color. So it seems a little complicated, but it's not. So with that in place, that gave us the control we were looking for. Uh, the really cool thing, like I said, it, it's a pretty fast system. It's easy, easy to update. It's quickly, you know, it's very responsive. So, for example, if I go back to this plane here, if I just turn this off, um, you remember initially I'd mentioned there was a noise, a noise modifier on that, and what that does is because these particles are being birthed off the geo, the uh, the birth object here, this noise can be changed to you know, whatever parameter you want, whatever scale you want, you can increase it, decrease it, and the particles are going to, you know, respond accordingly. So, for example, if we want, um, let's say we want, you know, we want 
more strength on the z-axis. Well, we can do that. So if it was kind of going up and down, we have total control there. If we want more strength on the y-axis, well, we just change that. You know, we can go up to 100 on the x-axis, and you can totally see that it's updating. It's very quick. It's responsive. There's no real lag in the system. So I'm just going to lower these back down a bit. And another really good thing, too, is because um, the particles are being birthed from this piece of geometry, it'll totally respond to other modifiers, too. So, for example, if we, I don't know, if the director came and said, well, we want to change it from being a straight line to have, you know, more of a curve. So we want the, you know, the solar sailor to go around a curve. Well, we can totally add a bend modifier to this plane. I think it's on Y that I would want to do it. And then we can, you know, increase the angle. So now we're going around a bend. Or, you know, we want it to go this way. Or we can change the direction. You know, maybe it's kind of going up a hill and then down. So using particles in this, in this regard was really great because it gave us the flexibility to go in and change things rapidly, uh, address comments, get, you know, a new version in the comp very quickly without having to wait for, you know, a modeler to kind of go in and model this piece by piece and then assemble it all as one big asset. So in that regard, it was really great. So the last part of dealing with this asset was to essentially bake out a mesh of the particles because the final frames were being rendered in Maya, so we had to find a way to get all of this data here exported out as Geo and into something, a format that Maya could read. So the way I did that is I grabbed a simple script from Bobo. If anybody doesn't know who Bobo is, um, you should check him out. He's an amazing Mac scripter. Uh, currently he's doing a lot of work with Thinkbox and the guys that do Deadline and Krakatoa and whatnot. But I got to work with him on Tron, and amazing guy, and the stuff he can do with Max Script is just incredible. But anyway, you can check out his site at uh, www.scriptspot.com forward slash Bobo. In here he has a whole bunch of scripts. But the one that I chose in particular is called uh, Snapshot PFlow Particles as Mesh. And all I did was I just selected this text here. So this might... Uh, let's see, let me read it. There we go. So we'll go Control C. We'll hop back into Max. Um, we'll bring up our, we're going to say new script. I'm simply going to paste that in there, and I'm going to select our our uh, PFlow here that we want to convert into an object. Now the one thing that you want to do, um, you can tell by the script here, the first three lines. The first line says macro script. What that's going to do is if you run the script now it's basically going to place a, a script in your macro script folder which is inside your max directory and then you'd have to go through customize um, customize user interface add it to a toolbar or whatnot what I did to kind of skip all those unnecessary steps is I just you can uh, comment them out uh, there's a tool here I can see if I can find it Block comment. There we go. So you can just comment that out. So essentially now when you execute the script, it's not going to take that into consideration. Or you can simply just delete those three. But for this purpose, I'll just comment them out. So now what's going to happen is I'm just going to select Tools, go Evaluate All. And if all works well, in a second here, it's kind of thinking, calculating all those particles. Once it's finished, we should have a mesh version of our particles. And there we go. So I'm just going to close this window here. So now we can see we have a, a new version here. Let me select. I'll just pull it out. So we have a completely new version. I'm just going to hide, hide our instancers here so we don't turn those off. So we have a mesh version of our particles created in the exact same world space. And now, I mean, if we wanted to go in, we can add, if we wanted to, we can add, add additional Greeble to this. We can play around with all these faces if we want to. Um, and that's essentially the way I created this whole scene. Um, one sec, I'm just going to hide, hide this stuff here so we can see what's going on. 
minor birther objects. So I'll turn on the corner rocks here, and I'll turn on our canyon here. Let's see here. There we go. And that's pretty much it. And then obviously the next step was we selected this, uh, we mirrored it, and we kind of slid it over a bit. And then that was kind of, and there you go, you kind of have your canyon. Now I'm pretty sure in the movie, I'm just gonna bring up the, uh, the shot here again. The method that I used uh, that I just showed you in this tutorial is kind of mainly used for R&D purposes. Um, eventually, Bobo, who wrote that little script there that I just used to convert the particles to geo, came up with this awesome, amazing script. It was kind of a, a Tron version of Greeble. So what it would do is take that base geometry that I'd modeled there, and then it, it would add all these different 30 degree and 60 degree cuts and then you could extrude and then of course once that geometry was kind of finalized layout wise then obviously they developed some shaders and then did some matte painting on top of it and projected on the geometry as well so you can kind of see you get some nice details nice highlights here you get lots of detail and a lot of uh, a lot of bits and pieces that really kind of add to the scale of the scene makes it look huge and kind of ominous so that's pretty much it. Um, if you have any questions regarding the, the uh, tutorial that I've just done, you know, kindly let me know. You can reach me at uh, joel at divisionof8.com. And I am also on Twitter, at Division of 8. So feel free to let me know what you think, or if you have any ideas for future tutorials, I'd be happy to uh, post some more for cgtootsplus.com. And until next time, thanks again. Cheers.